All right, everybody, welcome to a virtual bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We are here with our signature uh, virtual bourbon event, our flagship whiskey. And we've got a great lineup tonight. I want to introduce you to all four of our presenters today uh, as we uh, uh, will be meeting them just right now, but then we will be talking to them all individually uh, after that. So uh, I'd like to start out with, and we'll go the order that your placemat is. So you've got uh, the four uh, whiskeys and uh, you've got the placemat that Justine put together for you. And uh, we're going to go in the order that you see there. So that's going to be the order that I introduce our folks here. And uh, starting up first then is going to be Jeremy Deaver and Jade Peterson of Kentucky Artisan Distillery in Crestwood, Kentucky. Hey guys, how you doing? Very good. Thanks for having us, Steve. Pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. You got some Billy Goat Strut for us tonight and I uh, can't wait to have the group try that. Uh, should be, uh, um, you know, one that uh, I, I don't think a lot have tried. So it should be a, a great opportunity for our team here. Next up, we've got the team from Three Chord here. We've got Neil uh, Geraldo and uh, Ari Sussman. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, Steve. Thanks for having us. How are you? I'm doing good as well. Yeah, should be fun. I uh, can't wait to introduce uh, the, the team here to what you guys got going on. And, uh, you know, been hearing some great things. So it'll be fun to learn a little bit more about you guys and your signature whiskey. Wow, thank you. Yeah, and it's going to be a fun night, all these high proofs here. So next up is uh, Chris Fredrickson, uh, old friend here. He's been on several of these type of events with us. He's with Traverse City Whiskey Company. Chris, how are you doing? Hey, Steve, doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, very good. So 116.8 proof, yes. But of course, everything's bigger in Texas. We've got uh, Dan Garrison and Donna Todd with us from Garrison Brothers, and they're bringing in a, a whiskey tonight for us, 133.9 proof. How are you guys doing? How you doing, Steve? Thanks for the invite. Excited for you all to taste some cowboy. Thanks yes. for having us here, Steve. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, so how this will work, uh, we'll just go through our individual distillers. We do like to keep this right at 90 minutes. We, we know that, uh, you know, you get a fun group like this, it'd be, we could talk to these guys all night asking questions and about their products and what they're doing in their distilleries. But we like to keep it, you know, real sharp at, uh, at 90 minutes. So it'll, this will go to 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central. And uh, we'd like to have all of our uh, distillery representatives stick through the whole thing. So if you don't mind, uh, you know, uh, stick through and then be, be here for questions at the end. So that would be really great. If you can, if you can't, we understand, but we'd love to have you here at the end where you can answer some questions from the audience here. Uh, again, we're gonna start it out with Kentucky Artisan. Uh, you guys may know them uh, as Jefferson's Bourbon. They, you know, that's, they, they, they provide a lot of sourcing for different companies. And I guess the, the most well-known name is probably gotta be Jefferson's, right guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah probably, probably about eighty percent of our capacity is tied up with Jefferson's, and then we have uh, the other twenty percent remaining to our in-house brands and other smaller customers that are up and coming. Okay, and so so you guys, uh, and I want to be very clear, you do a lot of that, uh, you know, different sourcing things, and then some of you probably can talk about. There's probably some you can't, depending on the the situation. It's pretty well known Jefferson's because uh, that you guys share even you know take tours and things like that together. So that's that one's no secret by any means. But you do your own products as well. So talk to us a little bit about uh, what we're going to be trying here tonight, Billy Goat Strut. Well, uh, so we're going to be starting with Billy Goat Strut. It's a, a blend of two different rye whiskeys. Uh, it's a North American rye whiskey, which is uh, pretty unique from the standpoint that, you know, we have our neighbors to the north and they make good, consistent product. Um, and we thought it was an opportunity for us to take advantage of the 100% rye whiskey that we manufactured here at Kentucky Artisan Distillery with the uh, winter varietal uh, rhyme and rye that's uh, grown right up the uh, road. So we were taking our rye and then we were blending it with some of the Canadian rye to uh, not give it so much of that burn rye traditional tingle and kind of cut it down to give it a little bit more of a sweetness. Um, so there's two different types of Canadian rye in there as well as the Kentucky artisan rye. And um, we just thought that there was an opportunity because so many people are getting into the rye right now um, that we're kind of looking to differentiate ourselves on what we can do to uh, um, introduce it to a new audience. And, uh, and not just make it as a cocktail style rye, but also a sippable and up neat uh, or up straight rye. Mm -hmm. And even like, how did you come up with the, the you know, the, the image, which is, is really cool, has a real neat retro look to it. And even the name, where, where does this, all that come from? The, uh, well, the Billy Goat uh, Strut name is actually uh, named after an avenue downtown. Um, Geographically, it's it's placed right behind Angel's Envy, which we love bragging about. Um, so it's downtown, and what it was is, uh, you know, before Prohibition, when 
a lot of the whiskey would come down the river and they would blend it here in Louisville to entertain themselves. A lot of the distillers and people that would go downtown would actually uh, bet on goat races and they would have goat races down the alley, Billy Goat Strut Alley. And uh, it just kind of stuck. And uh, the owner of the brand, uh, Steve Thompson, um, as well as the majority owner of Kentucky Artisan Distillery saw an opportunity there. It's a very marketable and, uh, um, and sought after name, especially here in the area. So we figured, what can we do with such a weird uh, goat and a weird name? Let's make a, a unique and interesting product and put it in the bottle. But uh, that's kind of how, uh, how it evolved. And we're actually about 15 minutes northeast of downtown Louisville. Um, so we're still close enough, but uh, but we're we are not located on the alley. We just uh, we have the wonderful brand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and and uh, how did you guys come up with this idea of doing this? You know this this blend and and why why did uh, you know make some sense to do that? So it kind of tied in with some of the traditions when all the uh, barges were coming down here during low tide or low water levels for the spring, waiting for the rains. They would unload a lot of their whiskey that they were transporting from some of the northern states. Uh, and either, even all the way up into what's Canada now. And when they'd unload them, if they'd get rid of excess space or excess weight, they'd start combining barrels. Uh, and it was actually one of the, the first stages of inadvertent blending. So you'd have barrels that were getting mixed together and refilled up just to cut uh, kind of the, the onset of logistics in the shipping world. Um, so you started getting blending from these random barrels and we kind of felt that this kind of paid homage to that by bringing our product and topping off that Canadian and Northern whiskeys with the, the Kentucky rye that we've got here. Mm -hmm. And is this something that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start seeing Kentucky artisan more and more out there. Are you guys looking at expanding your distribution of, you know, beyond where you're at right now? Will we start seeing that, you know, grow to more States and things like that? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, that's always the plan, you know, this, uh, for those of us in the industry, we know that we're at the mercy of the distributors. Um, so we do everything we can to make it as marketable as possible. And especially in this region with, uh, Know, Indiana north of us uh, even to Ohio uh, and then south of us even into Tennessee um, we're starting to see a lot more um, tourists coming in from those certain areas and requesting a lot of the unique style stuff um, or you can get Jack and Jim anywhere so we're trying to take off of reach outward uh, and kind of follow in the footsteps of Jefferson's you know they've really uh, revolutionized a lot of the unique style brands coming out into the market and not necessarily copying that but we're, we're definitely trying to expand our horizons and offer more of the in-house brands and stuff back into Illinois so I can represent the home state a little bit. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. So yeah, I want to get it back to where you're from. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about that relationship with Jefferson's? Because they do have so many unique products and, and I, they've been leaders, uh, you know, at innovation and doing different things and adding value to the whiskey that they've sourced in the past and things like that. So with all these, you know, crazy different things that they do, is that stuff that they they tell you guys to do or do you guys collaborate on that is there a big you know meeting where you get together and come up with ideas on things how does it work yeah so the jefferson's brand's been you know 20 years plus that they've been out on the market with trey and chet and um, we've been lucky enough you know to be able to work with them for the last eight years here at kentucky artisan and we like you said we are the home of jefferson's currently with our tour center um, so we get a lot of interaction with trey on a daily basis and a lot of the ideas that are actually coming to market now have been kind of the brainchild of over the last five, 10 years, you know, between the marketing and the research that goes into them, finally getting those all the way uh, out to the bottle. Um, so a lot of these ideas are ones that were early on experiments that we opened up with here at KAD with our hot boxes and getting things out for them. Yep. So a lot of them are, you know, like you said, drinking round table style stuff and you, you're, you know, throwing darts at the wall for 10 ideas and hoping for one that sticks long term. Uh, the Twin Oak project and cert um, certainly some of the, the wine finish barrels all came uh, from ideas from Trey, but we were able to push through start to finish here at our facility. Okay. Last question before we drink some whiskey here, uh, because and we will ask this to all of our distillers uh, and distillers tonight. Uh, you know, the, the, we're all talking to craft distilleries here. So that means that, uh, you know, you haven't been in business as, as long as the big guys. You, you were talking about a flagship whiskey here. Is this, tell us where, you know, this thing's going to be at in five or 10 years. Is it, is, are you at exactly where you want to be with this product or will it continue to evolve and, and change over time? What, what do you see, foresee for this in the future? I think we'll both chime in here because we kind of sit at different seats for this. You know, Jeremy's on the, the marketing and brand management side and I'm on the distilling side. So I'd love to see our capacity continue to increase, you know, with this product taking up more of a majority of it and actually have uh, more options that come out down the road instead of just the blended uh, rye that we've got here, but actually transition into a, a Kentucky bourbon and some other barrel aged products that we've been working on 
including a smoked rye that we tried on uh, one of your other episodes, Steve. So mm-hmm. we've got a lot of, a lot of leeway, especially with the tour center here to try out some real small batch stuff and see how it hits the market and then be able to scale it up since it's all in house. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, yeah. you want to weigh too? Yeah, and I'm going to have to piggyback off that uh, uh, as well. You know, from the marketing standpoint, we're definitely in a brand style business. Uh, We definitely feel that this brand has legs, especially in the Kentucky area and in the market in the region, Louisville, uh, you know, as far as the Lexington um, and anywhere up the Ohio River. Once you get that story out there and they find that their brand recognition, um, then we can definitely start introducing, um, you know, other different types of SKUs and brands. I mean, Jeffrey, comes to that, you know, they have their base model. Yeah, I definitely see there's legs and, uh, you know, along Billy Goat Strut, we also have Whiskey Row, uh, which is a wonderful bourbon that's in-house bourbon. It's a blend of seven-year-old. Um, so we, we're, we're slowly getting up there. You know, as most of the distillers will know that on, um, on the chat conversation tonight, you know, you do what you can, you can go on to get some money coming to the door, and then you can really start getting excited because you can lay down some barrels. And, uh, now that seven, eight years in, we're doing a lot more I, I definitely see good things for the plan okay well let's uh if you haven't done so already go ahead and pour uh this one out so the billy goat strut first one on your placemat and uh we always like to do this kind of walk through and uh, nosing and tasting notes if you guys want to lead us on this and tell us what we should be expecting here as we as we start uh enjoying this one so you're going to get that traditional rye burned, that little upfront spice right on the tip of your tongue. Um, and then like Jeremy was saying, between the two Canadians that we blended in here, you get a little bit more sweetness, a little dried fruit. A lot of people say apricot or raisin. Um, and a lot of that baking spice kind of falls in right behind it. Um, almost kind of like a Christmas cookie almost. It's kind of what we get a lot of people on the tour that say you get that, that note right there. Mm-hmm. On the nose, again, we always like to start with that for our audience. Again, please feel free to utilize the chat and let us know what you think. It's always fun to talk with us with our, our thing. Alpha, alpha. Okay. <laughs> Specific. I'm getting like apple on the nose for sure. So pretty. Yeah, it's definitely fruit forward. I know I had it with dessert last time. My wife and I made oatmeal raisin cookies and it was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Apple, honey, Chibli. Okay. That's right on coriander and cilantro so, i've heard some brandy fans uh enjoy it too especially if you're a brandy sipper you enjoy kind of that fruit forward style stuff really mm-hmm. uh, lots of fresh grass and fruit vanilla holding it all together dark chocolate noses like a brandy there you go all right let's give this one a taste and see where we're at here That's, that is pretty delightful. It's, it's different. And, and it's really what we wanted to go for. You know, it's, uh, we didn't want to be just a standard traditional rye. Right. On our tasting table, we've got some, you know, we're going up to a few hundred dollar bottles of bourbon. So we wanted to offset that with this rye that we could produce that gave a completely separate profile. Um, when you get used to sitting down tasting six of the same thing, it's kind of <laughs> nice for us to be able to offer that separate option, especially for the gift shop. Um, then I, we didn't really touch on it, but the, the ages on everything, the, the Kentucky rye was a four-year-old and then the two uh, Northern whiskeys were both six-year-olds that we used. Okay. Yeah, and we're getting a lot of this, this type of stuff in there, you know, very sweet and smooth, uh, oatmeal cookies, uh, sugar cookies with sprinkles, uh, buttered toffee and rye spice. I, I, yeah, it's, it is definitely, you know, really sweet and uh as someone said they're way more than most typical rice but they also do get that rice spice it's not lost in there so you, you do get nice nice amount of spice to it so it's cool green apple on the tongue yeah that's that's what i get so bob whitlatch and i are on the same page there todd bourbon's getting billy goat <laughs> I've never licked a goat <laughs> yeah no that's not suggested for sure. Yeah. We did some billy goat races last year. We actually have pictures of Jade pulling a billy goat. So that's that was true. pretty cool. We did do that. Really? When you kicked off the brand or something? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Anybody, anything else on this one? Murph just finished it. Clearing that up. <laughs> Todd was answering a previous question. Delicious. 
nice long finish. Yeah. Great stuff, guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, really enjoy this one. Uh, Jade, you, you know, uh, I've been a fan of this. So you uh, let me try a sample. And uh, yeah, yeah, really good stuff. So glad I got everybody else got to enjoy this one. So cheers. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Next up is Neil and Ari from uh, the uh, Three Chord uh, Bourbon. Uh, how are you guys doing? We're great. How are you doing, Steve? And I'm everybody? Doing, doing great as well. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you guys got into this business. How did, how did this come about? All right. So, uh, by the way, Billy, Groat, uh, Billy Goat Strut is very nice, by the way, fellas. It is nice. Great. Well done. Well done. Um, well, I, I just started this business uh I have no idea reason why I'm a songwriter, <laughs> musician, producer. <laughs> That's what I do. But um, but I, I write screenplays as well. And I was working on a screenplay, uh, a treatment for an idea, and I posted something on social media. And so a good friend of mine saw it says, well, what are you thinking about doing? Well, anyway, I got together with him and we talked. And um, he said, why don't we get a spirits company to give us some money to do a, a trailer? Because I, I wanted to do an independent film. I wasn't looking for a big budget. I was right, just right, looking right. for some seed money, right? And uh, and he said that to me. I says, why don't we start our own company? And he laughed. He thought it was kind of goofy. But this was May 16, 2016. And okay. Steel Bending Spirits was born on that day. And then we scoured the country. And I, I, I'm the first guy to tell you, um, I don't I don't know a lot about spirits. I mean, I enjoy brown spirits. I enjoy enjoy a lot of uh, different kinds. Um, but Ari's Usman and the, and my team are are phenomenal. And uh, you know, it's like when you put a band together, you try to get the best players you can, mm -hmm. uh, and to stay in their lanes. Now, before I say anything, I always have to include every member of our team, and I'll do this quick. Hannah Geraldo, my daughter, Tony DeYoung, Ryan Gill. Michael Nanula, Laura Webb, Megan Reckling, Ari Zussman, Rich Jones, Debbie Lenoy, Brian Canning, Barry Bookin, Bass Reeves, and Paul Nanula. It's very important because everybody is important. We have meetings, we have Zoom calls all the time. Everybody's engaged. Everybody works hard for the common goal of what this company is about. And I want to mention one more thing before we start talking about the spirit. We started a music ambassadorship from the very beginning because I have a place in my heart for musicians, uh, everybody that's struggling during the COVID time, but this was even before that. Yeah. So yeah. we have a music ambassadorship where we do three chord stages where we pay the band to play. We do tip jars, uh, PayPal, uh, on Facebook and live events like that so musicians can get paid that way. We support musicians, uh, uh, blue societies, Detroit blue societies. When I found out that Sun House didn't have a tombstone, it kind of really hit me hard. So we really support all the blues uh, uh, societies all throughout the country. So the music ambassadorship was something that was important to us. We started it early. We plan to stay with it. That's a big give back poem. Uh, component of what our business is about. So anyway, we scoured the country looking for a master distiller, master blender. I met Ari Zussman in Michigan. It took me two seconds to say, okay, he's our guy. I uh -huh. shook his hand, gave him a hug. He became our distiller. I built the team all around all the people and that's how we started. Nice. nice. Yeah. So that was 2016, May 16. Now we're a very young company, but we're talking about how many SKUs we have right now, Ari? About six? A whole lot. Yeah, we have about six, and, and we have a, a a few special releases that we're going to be coming out with uh, in 2021. Cool. Right. So, Ari, tell us a little bit about, you know, your philosophy to all these things. Are, are you guys, uh, I, I obviously, you're, what we're going to be drinking tonight is something that you've blended together, but uh, tell us a little bit. Are you guys also doing some distilling, too? Yeah, so really interesting concept here. Um, I, I trained as a winemaker in okay. Europe before I got into spirits. And so I, I brought a little bit of a different sort of philosophy uh, to, to my work with spirits. Um, we are blenders first and foremost. We wear that very proudly. And to us, what that means is we go across the country and we find really, well, we go across the continent, really. It's beyond mm -hmm. the country. In fact, this Canadian ride that we just tried is really sensational. And I think that it has uh, that that style of rye has a definite role to play um, when we talk about rye whiskey in general. Um, but we are you know, we're very proud of of how we blend in all of our spirits. Uh, we kind of start with the conception, 
an idea of what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, then we scour the country looking for spirits that, that the, co the continent, looking for spirits that can make that happen. Um, and uh, we take blending very seriously. We've studied the old world techniques in Scotland and cognac and in other places. Uh, and uh, that's, that's our philosophy. Now, do we distill? We do not distill in house. Mm -hmm. We are distilling under contract with multiple distilleries across the country. Yes. Uh, unique mash bills, uh, heirloom varietals of grain, we're as serious about the whiskeys that we contract to make as we are about the whiskeys uh, that we purchase for our blends. So you're so doing a lot blend. of uh, we're cooking in your kitchen. So you're because you're, you're you're kind of setting down everything that you're, you're not just going and saying, hey, could we buy some whiskey? You're 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 putting together. This is what we're looking for. This mash bill and and all those type of things. Correct. Yeah, not typically mash bill, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and we can get into the weeds on that. I'm, I'm less concerned with mash bill uh, as I am with other characteristics. I think especially when uh, we we use quite a bit of 12 to 16 year old bourbon mm -hmm. in our blends nothing can fill up the low end of a blend quite like a you know a 12 right. to 16 year old bourbon right um and and recently we've been using a lot of tennessee bourbon low barrel entry proof to fill out that component of our blends it's a mm -hmm. really important part whereas we might use an indiana like an mgp style more citrus note to form the mid palate and we would generally use more grain forward younger kentucky straight whiskey uh 24 to 30 months old to form sort of I, I like to taste the grain not just the wood when i have whiskey uh and so to be able to 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 put together a whiskey that incorporates you know it just so happens that uh it incorporates all these different ages but also states so we we happen, you know, for our, our, our baseline products, we are sourcing from multiple states, blending from multiple distilleries. Uh, single source whiskey is great. We love lots of single source whiskeys, but in our experience and the experiments that we've had together, uh, Neil and myself, we found that if you can blend house styles, sometimes you come to uh, a product that's, that's, you know, in some ways greater than the sum of its parts. And that's what blending's about. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about 12 Bar Reserve, what we're going to be sampling tonight. Tell us how, how that one came about. So 12 Bar Reserve, you know, Neil, why don't you tell them how it is? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to say this right off the bat. If you see odd numbers on our proofs, you're going to see odd numbers for the, the length of this company because I don't like even numbers. So I mm -hmm. try to, if Ari's cooking up anything, it's always got to be an, uh, an odd number proof. But, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just a weird thing. I do it. I do it. There's a synergy between music and blending. And Ari, and Ari and I, we talk a lot about it. It's like a, if you write a song, there's an infancy stage. Then you go to adolescent stage. Then you, you, know, you write it, you arrange it, produce it, you play it, you mix it. You master it. There's all these processes, right? So, so when we started talking about this, I said, Ari, let's start with, a, let's start with a, uh, our, our entry level. We start with a blend at uh, 81 proof and uh that's correct ari right was it at 81 yeah so we started at that so our evolution is to gradually get bigger and bolder and you know stuff like that so um awry is between all this too 12 bar reserve came after the rye is that right ari that's right it did right so the we have a rye called amplify rye then we went to 12 bar reserve so uh, in conversations i have with ari i says let's let's get bigger let's get bolder you know, let's get it more proof. Let's get more of a hug to it. Let's, you know, let's build this thing up as we're going. And Ari just did his uh, superior magic in his little workshop that, uh, what's well, not a little, it's a big workshop. And uh, <laughs> and he just, uh, he just nailed it right on head. Now, I'm just going to add one more thing to this company. That's, that's every, every business and every company has a story. All right, we have a lot of stories. We don't have to get into all those. But when we started testing the, the expression or taste profile for the bourbon to begin with, we went to Michigan at a club where we tried 17 of these different bourbons. Now, again, me being the virgin bourbon guy, I mean, I've been drinking bourbon, my, not my whole life, but a big part of it. I would take little sips. These guys are big sips, and they're, you know, they're doing all this. I said, ah, this is too sweet, this is this. Then until we got to the end, the last one, and they poured this last one, I took a sip of it. I said, Ari, that's the one. 
why did we wait 17 to get? And it was a 16-year-old Hirsch. So Ari just went like this. He goes, oh, my God, why would you do that for? So anyway, so we want to shoot high for, for, for our products. And, uh, you know, I've got a great team, like I said. I, I love our team. Ari's a phenomenal distiller and blender. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how 12 Bar came together. Um, uh, in, in, in addition to the, to the odd numbers, you'll see that uh, – each of our expressions has a sort of musical tie-in or a musical theme to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So 12 Bar is, is, is about the blues and about rock and roll and country music and, and, and the most elemental kind of forms of American music. Uh, and, and Neil said, go big. So we, uh, we were able to, to find some really nice 12-year-old Kentucky, um, really nice 12 year old Kentucky bourbon. And then we ended up blending that with uh, some 14 year old Tennessee. And the Kentucky bourbon comes in at a, at a higher proof. The Tennessee comes in at a lower proof. And uh, when we got the blend just right, it ended at, at 107 proof. Um, and that's just where the blend sang. And so the, the idea of, of taking Kentucky and a Tennessee and, and, and blending them together and not just mixing them together in a blending tank, let the, letting them sit for a good long while, letting them really marry together. Um, Neil talked about the songwriting process and his creative process, which has been, you know, for me as a distiller, to hear someone who's had success with their creativity in, in kind of putting together these very intricate songs, um, the patience that it takes, the, the steps that it takes, it does remind me a lot of blending. blending in my opinion, is not something that happens quickly. You have to be very patient. And, and you know, uh, distillers, we we are very patient people. Uh, you know, we look at our friends that are brewers who get to turn around tanks after six weeks, and and, and release it, release something to the public six weeks after conceiving of it. It's you know, uh, it, we're very jealous of that. It takes us right. a lot longer <laughs> to get product out. So the idea behind Twelve Bar was. Uh, make something that's going to be more complex than a single source heavily aged product so hopefully get uh different notes from the kentucky and from the tennessee find where they harmonize with one another let them sit let them marry uh tweak it over time and we're very happy with uh with the results from this one very nice. And last question before we drink the whiskey, what would you like to ask? You know, you, you're at a spot here. This is your, your flagship whiskey on for this event. Uh, is this exactly where you want it to be, or do you see some evolution of this over time? So we are very uh, transparent mm -hmm. in what we do. We say where our whiskeys come from. We, you know, we say... Uh, when people ask us, we can potentially get into conversations about even proportions of different whiskeys. We want to let the consumer come in, look under the hood, kick around, see exactly what we're doing as blenders because blending really, we, we love distilling as well. Um, that's a, for me, that's more like a technician thing. Blending is really where the artistry and perspective comes in. Sort of creating a, a unique bat mash bill is, is, is sort of uh, you know, where the artistry comes in on the distilling side. And then hopefully you make it as consistently as possible. Um, but blending is really, uh, it's going to be different every time a little bit mm -hmm. because the casks that you're selecting are going to be different every time. Right, uh, right. We're not Johnny Walker. We don't have tens of thousands of casks to select from. So we are very explicit with batch numbers and each batch is going to be a little bit different. And, and at this point, uh, you have the 107. We have batches that are that are other proofs as well, um, mm -hmm. and it's just we allow the batch to take us where it wants to go, and we don't come in with too many preconceived notions about it has to be this or that. We're we're tasting through barrels. If we find uh, a 12 year old Tennessee that has uh, really amazing sort of dark spice notes, and then a Kentucky that maybe because it's placement in the Rick House or whatever weirdness and magic happens in the rickhouse has more fruity flavors and together it kind of tastes like uh, it's got an apple pie characteristic mm -hmm. we will release that as a batch because it's really good together so every batch is uh, just a little bit different mm -hmm. 
Uh, a question came in, Ari, real quick before we before we do try the whiskey uh, from Evan Van Skoik. He's want to know when you're when you're blending, do you do small and fast batches, so a lot of different batches? I'm guessing he's saying, or do you start with bigger batches and and slow? So just you, you kind of uh, we start with small batches. I call them micro blends. Okay. And uh, we might have twenty to thirty micro blends that we're revisiting at okay. different times of the day after coffee before going home coming in you know at nine o'clock at night we just try it all different times of the day and again blending is a very slow process in the way that we do it um and, and it really is a process that you you let when it happens well you let the spirits that are in your tasting glass kind of dictate what you do some batches take longer than i assume it's like writing a song some take longer than others some come together really quickly and it's really great and some make you work for it uh so we start with small batches as you translate into big batches it's never a one-to-one -one. it's never just like uh oh it's the same thing but more you know wine gallons um it changes a little bit and then the and then the, the blend continues to change in the blending vessel over a month or six weeks or eight weeks, it will continue to evolve. And uh, in, in, in during that time, we tweak it. Maybe we add a little bit more of this or that. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, uh, it's time to uh, enjoy some of this whiskey. So tell us what we should be expecting, you know, first on the nose and then taste wise. Uh, I'd like to say that, you know, this is, this is our blender's take on a big traditional American bourbon. This is kind of our wall of sound. Uh, you know, yeah. the musical yeah. expression. Like this is bringing it to you. Uh, that's the idea with that. Now, at the same time, one thing that we're not trying to do here uh, is necessarily hit people. It, it, it is not. Uh, this is not an alcohol first kind of whiskey. This is. This is. You're gonna get a lot of wood. You're gonna get a lot of esters, right? A lot of you know those characteristics that you'll find in a, in a properly aged whiskey. Um, those will hopefully come through here, but the low end is really low. Like the, 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 the dark spice woody character, that's deep. And what we try to do with 12 bar is like, you're, you're gonna taste this for a while after you drink it. It's designed for that. And the nose is very, very important. Very important yeah. to us. Yeah, we're seeing things come in on the, on the nose like cranberry and uh, peanut brittle and I'm, I'm getting some of that stone fruit. Mm -hmm. um, another person said nutty, so yeah, uh, fig I see, homemade applesauce on the nose. I've gotten peanut brittle before. Peanut brittle yeah. has come up before. Yeah, peanut brittle, I, I definitely, I agree with those folks that said that. Let's give this one a taste and see what Rock we got. sugar, on. maple, we got a lot of maple. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Impressively long finish. Oh, wait two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Even more impressive. Yeah. Three, three, minutes. three, three minutes. minutes. Okay. Three, three minutes. minutes. All right. No, Start two the clock. Start three the clock. Point one, three minutes. There, there you go. Yeah. yeah but this is... is a chewer, right? So mm -hmm. no. uh, we definitely look for viscosity in this kind of, in this style. Um, and one of the great things about being a blender is you get to play around with styles. Right, just like a musician gets to play around with different styles, we are not at all locked into anything. So this, the concept behind twelve bar reserve is this is an elemental, just like the twelve bar blues is the twelve twelve bar pattern is an elemental pattern. That's what we're kind of looking for here. This is like a archetypal kind of blended uh, bourbon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, uh, maple fudge. Somebody said creamy peanut brittle. Um, Someone said there needs to be a word to describe how long it lingers. Yeah. Eucalyptus and pine nuts. There's uh, definitely a lot of layers to your flavor there. So yeah, there's, there's a lot, a lot to this one. It's that wall of sound, right? Mm -hmm. The, the of wall of sound. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And these comments that I see are funny. <laughs> Neil Peart drum solo. Well, I like the Phil Spector of bourbon. 
<laughs> you know, back to, you know, I want to talk this a billy goat strut. It, you know, it's a great name. And mm -hmm. It's a great bourbon. You know, names are important. I, I just spend three seconds on a name or less. When I was trying to find a name of the, of the, I got steel bending spirits, but I started with steel bending bourbon. That sounded like you were going to drink metal. That was a bad idea. That was a horrible idea. So I kept coming these names and I kept trying to get these. And every time I tried, my trademark attorney said, no, it was taken, it's taken. And he told me that the reason it was taken because the best name didn't come yet. And I went to sleep, woke up the next day and I went, wait a minute, what's truth? Three chords in the truth. Integrity in its simplest form. Except three chords bourbon doesn't doesn't have a swing to it. Three chord bourbon has a swing to it. So I called him first thing in the morning. I said, "How about three chord bourbon?" And we ended up getting it. And that that we we base it all on on musical terms like we have twelve bar going and uh, amplify rye, you know, and then whiskey drummer, which isn't part of this thing, but but which we just got a question about. Oh, we did get a question about whiskey drummer. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to address how how the the question was. How is our 12 bar reserve different than the whiskey drummer? Uh, the 12 bar reserve, like we said, is, is sort of like the wall of sound, archetypal uh, whiskey, trying to incorporate both the best of, of Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, and uh, whiskey drummer, and in, in, in it's also very accessible in its price point. Uh, so despite those age statements, we really try to get that in under 80 bucks. This is a bourbon we really want to share with everybody that wants to try it. Um, and then every once in a while, you get to have uh, access to a very small uh, amount of whiskey that might be in like a really small lot. Um, and that's how, whiskey, that's how Whiskey Drummer happened. Whiskey Drummer is a very limited release, 2,500 bottles um, that we put out. It was a, it was a different style for us. Uh, like uh, our first expression was 81 proof and, and the point was to be as accessible as possible. Whiskey Drummer, which we came out with uh, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, uh, is 117.9 proof, 100% Kentucky 15 year uh, from a totally unique mash bill that we had not seen before. I lined it up next to every other 15 year old Kentucky that I could find and I'm convinced it has a different yeast strain as well. I think the differences in flavor do not come from the mash bill. I think it really comes, I think this was a one-off thing that somebody did. Um, it was very expensive. We ended up price having to price that bottle at 180 bucks a bottle mm -hmm. um, uh, and sold out very quickly. <laughs> it was uh, so it was, it was it was a hit right yeah um, it was a hit but, yeah. But very, yeah. uh, so the difference is 12 bar is an expression that we would like to keep on the market for as long as possible yeah. and we're doing everything we can to secure the inventory to keep that going to allow it to grow in a, in a very managed way uh whereas a whiskey drummer was intended from the very beginning to be a very small release uh now, of course, I kept some of the 15 year old back because it was really interesting and unique by itself. And, and we kind of broke our own mold by releasing something that that was not a blend from multiple uh, distilleries. It was just really, really good by itself. And we wanted to put it out there. But we did keep some back because it's going to be involved in some of our future projects, uh, releases that will come out over the next year, which are going to feature. Um, all kinds of interesting inputs. So like, like I said, we're a big fan of, uh, of the hundred percent sort of Alberta style rise, right? Those are really cool. Uh, I particularly love them in the 15 to 17 year old age where they start taking on really bright fruit characteristics, super weird. You would never taste that in, uh, and, and here I am talking about, you know, a rye component that, that went into the, I really enjoyed this Billy Goat Strong. Um, but uh, those Canadian ryes that are aged in used barrels where the wood does not obscure the grain mm -hmm. and they're allowed to age properly for a very long time develop characteristics that you will never find that nobody will ever find in, in a new American oak barrel right and those characteristics that you can find in these super aged ryes are really good and a lot of the time they play well with you know 15 year old Kentucky yeah. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate it. And uh, please do stick around. Uh, we've got some more great whiskey to try. You can, and that's one of the cool things too. Justine takes care of that. Make sure that our guests get uh, some whiskey to enjoy uh, for coming on with us. They get to try everything too. So that's a neat little aspect of this.
All right. Next up is Chris Fredrickson of Traverse City Whiskey Company. Chris, how you doing, man? Howdy, gang. It's uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, good seeing you again. Good seeing you. So, uh, yeah, we've got two companies from uh, Michigan here tonight, and we've got a lot of people from Michigan here, too. So, Bears from Michigan, Justine. Um, there's others, too. I'm missing somebody, but uh, plenty plenty of Miss Michigan connections here tonight. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about what, uh, what we're going to be drinking this evening. Yeah, so uh, what we're going to be drinking is our um, Traverse City Whiskey Company, straight bourbon whiskey at full barrel strength. So you may or may not recognize this from the shelf, mm -hmm. uh, but this is a, it's, it's our black label with gold foil. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a six to eight year um, straight bourbon. Right now, let's see here. What, Steve, what proof are you guys sipping at? We have the uh, 116.8. Great. Same, same. All right. All right, good. Yeah, we're on the same so, page. <clears throat> Um, to give a little context to what we're about to sip, um, I share a few details about kind of who we are as a company and how we got started and yes. how it led us to this tasting journey via Zoom during the pandemic. Um, so back in back in 2012, um, myself along with uh, two gents that I went to undergrad with at Michigan State um, had an idea. Uh, for a whiskey company after discovering some um, family history. And at, back in 2012, uh, we had an opportunity to purchase um, 20 four-year-old MGP bourbon barrels. And at the time we had full-time jobs. Um, I was in management consulting. My two business partners were practicing attorneys and we were just, we were sick of the grind. And um, with the family history combined with this opportunity for 20 bourbon barrels, um, we, uh, and may I add bourbon barrels that really fit the kind of the mold and the flavor profile that we were so drawn and attracted to. We started this brand, not even distillery, but just brand called Traverse City Whiskey. And um, we launched in July of 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, well, by the end of the year, we realized that we were onto something. So we acquired a chunk of property downtown Traverse City, which for those of you that don't know, um, Traverse City is up in the, up in the pinky up in Northern Michigan, right on Lake Michigan. If you look at the back of our bottle, it, uh, it's front and center. There's an arrow pointing to <laughs> our hometown mm -hmm. and we acquired a chunk of land. <clears throat> we built a, built a distillery, um, Actually, uh, I was uh, I was informally trained at Michigan State under Dr. Chris Berglund, and um, one of the fine gents that walked uh, me and our crew through the use of our still was Ari Sussman. Ari, great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is a very small industry. There's Class uh, reunion, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's, <laughs> it's really great having um, you know any time uh, getting back to the birth of our company if we've ever had questions if we've ever needed help um you know in the whiskey game you can't really guess you can't you, you don't want to be in a position where you you gamble on on a project that could go two to 20 years out only to open a barrel <clears throat> and be disappointed it's not a thing um so we've asked for help along the way <clears throat> and um you know we started distilling back in late 2014 and um we have our still house and tasting room downtown traverse city We've been making um, a, a copious amount of bourbon and rye um, with both mash bills similar to MGP, uh, but also our kind of our trademarked 100% um, rye whiskey. Back to what we're drinking right now, um, our straight bourbon. This is uh, this bourbon won a double gold and best in category at the San Francisco International Spirits Competition in 2019 and won a gold this year. Uh, this is from our uh, first set of MGP bourbon barrels. Uh, it's been aging in Northern Michigan now for over six years and is kind of a hallmark to our barrel proof portfolio. Uh, we do have several other barrel proof expressions, but of course this is the only one we're going to chat about tonight. Gotcha. <clears throat> so uh, 
you know, we always like to ask, you know, the future is, is, is this going to evolve a bit or, or what do you think is, is going to be the future for this uh, signature edition barrel proof we've got here? Yeah. Yeah. It will, it will continue evolving. Um, you know, this is, <clears throat> this is source bourbon from our first batch. Um, Traverse city whiskey, our, our moniker is the, the whiskey of the North and and what that means to us is, you know, up in, up in northern Michigan, we have a very harsh aging climate. Um, a lot of expansion, a lot of contraction because of all the temperature um, fluctuation. And this product will continue to evolve. I mean, it, it's ever changing every year. Um, you know, we, we do have a lot of fun uh, with the aging cycle of most barrels. Um, you know, you open, open each age barrel during its lifetime and it it's amazing what type of fluctuations you get in where it's at um year to year and one year it could be great the next year you're like oh you know there's a, that moment of panic what happened with the with the 2014 or 2013 barrels what happened and then you wait and you're patient and you open them the next year and and Magic. goodness <laughs> yeah. right? it, it's That's just right. something spectacular so this this um, bourbon that we're trying right now is a 75% corn, 21% rye, and 4% malted barley mash bill. Uh, it is a traditional MGP mash bill that, like I said, has been aging up in northern Michigan for more than six years. And uh, full-bodied, packs a punch, um, has a very, uh, you know, as, as others have mentioned, a very traditional American bourbon, excuse me, very traditional bourbon um, uh, both flavor profile, nose, taste. Um, before I before I front load my own tasting notes here, I'd, I'd be curious if anybody could share some of their own uh, interpretation. Yeah, um, we we like doing that. So yeah, please. starting to come in now. Jason's first one. Uh, lots of oatmeal on the nose. Spearmint, maple, caramel on the nose. Toasted oak. Mm -hmm. Nose butter, <laughs> spice cake, cherry, caramel, cherry vanilla, cola on the nose. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting some cocoa, mm -hmm. some cinnamon, I mean, that traditional vanilla. Yeah. I, what I love about the nose, though, is it just, the, the nose really does, it really prepares you for what what's about to come. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, the banana bread. That's what I'm getting too. A little banana. Yeah, bread. like banana bread. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. All right, let's give this thing a taste and see what we got here. A lot of great nosing nose notes there. Let's try it on the taste. So guys, as we're as we're tasting, just a little bit about the evolution of what this product will become. Um, not not next year, the year after, but in the future. Um, we we have been um, under construction of our distilling campus up in Traverse City for the last couple of years, uh, mostly in the planning phase, but have since broken ground. And by this time next year, we're going to be running. Um, right now, we're running a pot column combo still, and a year from now, we're going to be running a 24 inch Vendome column, and it's gonna it it will impact the flavor profile years out of course um but it uh it, it's certainly going to be an evolution for you know not not kind of being so dead set with that that mgp lifeline which we uh we thought a couple years ago we were straying from and have since um had to rely on <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah anyway um taste steve what do you think i, I i'm definitely getting cinnamon on the taste uh, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of kind of get a little bit of that banana bread on the that I got on the nose, kind of getting that on the taste too. So it's kind of combination and uh, great finish on this thing too. Great, great finish. Other things that are coming in: uh, caramel, banana bread, dark chocolate, allspice, cinnamon, caramels, spice, cherry oak, nutty, cherry oak. Mm -hmm. Very specific. I like that. Yeah, very good. UP's a beautiful area up there, Chris. You got, 
<laughs> That's a beautiful part of Michigan. You know, Steve, the door's always open. <laughs> it's a nice Absolutely. Place. <laughs> yeah, this is r really good stuff. Uh, Chris, on your tasting notes, what do you what do you typically get when you're drinking this one? Yeah, I mean the 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 baseline is always that there's a, there's a <laughs> subtle, subtle hints of uh, of vanilla, and I'm I'm overwhelmed with kind of that that cinnamon and cocoa, um, that also some floral notes. Mm-hmm. Drop of water. Mm -hmm. There, pulls some of the oak up front. Justine, what about you? What do you think? <laughs> Justine, um, there she is. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> uh, I'm getting a lot of like the spice cake that I got on the nose. It's almost like a. I know typically fruit cakes get a lot of not so good notes at the around Christmas time, but like you do get like the the dark fruit, cherry, mm -hmm. cake, cake. Mm. That's good. That is very good. Anything else, everybody? I like when Neil talks. He's like the voice of God. It's just, <laughs> that is incredible. No, no. That was <laughs> incredible. I, did. I need to get this set up, Neil. I'm going to come up there, and you need to set me up what I got to get. Well, I've recorded a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I should know how to you do can, You can tell. You can tell. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that part. <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. Yeah. yeah. I wish I had your knowledge on all this stuff and all you guys and everybody. Yeah. I think this is this is fantastic. Fantastic stuff. Both great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really like what you got going here. And like everything, you know, I, I don't know if you saw all those comments coming through. We did the, a lot of people on this event did when you did your release the barrel strength cherry uh, whiskey. And man, that is some really good stuff, my friend. So uh, I saw a lot of comments coming up in that. So that's, that's a good one, brother. So cool. Well, Chris, hang out with us. All right. We'll, we'll get to a Q&A at the end. I'm sure people got some questions for it. Thank you. All right. Our last team here, we've got uh, Dan Garrison and Donna Todd from Garrison Brothers. Gentlemen, how are you guys? Awesome. Thanks for having us here, Steve. By the way, I'll give you $37 for that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to it or something? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Doing good, Steve. Thank you for the invite. I'm going to let Dan uh, take the lead and talk a little bit about Garrison sure. Brothers and the history and the company. And then uh, – uh, when he's ready and uh, everyone else is ready, uh, I'll really dive into the nuts and bolts and we can okay. go down that rabbit hole as far as we want uh, with our uh, cowboy bourbon. I will ask everyone to please pour it now. If you still have it trapped, please pour it in your glass okay. and let it sit there. Uh, Dan likes to stretch the lungs a little bit, so to give it a chance <laughs> to uh, uh, to breathe. But uh we need to you need to pull out your cowboy hat and put it on. This one needs to breathe. Yeah, one thirty three point nine. This is definitely uh, going to be a powerful one. It's it's a good, good number. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's odd. Steve, so it's good. Steve, I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of this tonight. I, I am a little bit of a, a, a Garrison Brothers bourbon socialist, meaning that I don't drink anything else but what Donis makes today. So mm -hmm. um, I have my eyes have been opened and. Some of the comments on on these earlier bourbons, the peanut butter and applesauce, dead solid, perfect. Love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's just good. Kind of, I love getting a group together when they come up with those things, and then you you can find it sometimes. So yeah, it's cool. My eyes have been opened because I think we're doing everything as best we can. But good lord, you guys have got some sensational products up there in Michigan. And, and also in Kentucky. I mean, really, really cool work to, to be able to taste these different bourbons tonight and, and whiskeys. And I really appreciate the, the invitation to be here. Yeah. Um, it's funny, I feel like kind of the senior citizen on the panel because I was, I started my distillery in 2003. That's when I bought my land. In 2004, I attended Chris Berglund's class at Michigan State uh, back in the day. I think it was the very first class that he ever put on. And I was there, there were six people in the room. One of the guys had his own plane and had flown his other two people into the, to the, the, the um, event. And it was, it was literally six people in the room and Bill uh, from, from distilling.com was there, the ADI. 
And it was the first bourbon event I'd ever been a part of back in the day. And it, a lot of the topic was how to make vodka. And I'm like, I don't give a shit. I don't want to make vodka. I'm not going to make vodka. But um, it was an interesting time uh, because we were all we all kind of recognized that we were on the cusp of this this new tradition that was going to happen in America. At the time, there were nine distilleries in Kentucky making 35 brands of bourbon, and sales were declining seven percent per year. Hmm. Can you imagine that? Yeah. yeah, that's really the way it was. It was crazy. I mean, it, bourbon was granddaddy's drink. Nobody drank bourbon. Everybody was drinking vodka and cocktails. So. Um, I, I've, I've, I've loved this business. I still love this business. And I, I feel like I'm the, I'm, I'm the luckiest man in the world. I get to drink good bourbon with new friends every single night. And that's just couldn't ask for more than that out of life. So God has blessed me and I'm very lucky and very fortunate. And this has been so much fun tonight. So um, the Cowboy Bourbon started with 11 barrels that we set aside that were just weird. They were the outcasts. They were, it was back in 2000. 13 that we started selecting these barrels and it wasn't a selection process they were they were the ones that nobody else wanted mm -hmm. and i came to donna's and i said something like you know what the hell are we going to do with all this bourbon because i don't want to have to call the ttb and t i don't want to have to file one of these reports that i've got to burn up all of the alcohol i don't i don't even want to go through that shit. so let's see what happens if we marry these nasty 11 barrels together let's see what happens and the result was a 142 proof masterpiece. Just 11 10 gallon barrels. That's all it was. It was crazy. <laughs> They've been sitting in the Texas heat, you know, 110 degrees for, for, for literally three years, I think, when we married those bourbon bottles together. And sure enough, we tasted the liquid and Donna's and I looked at each other and went, oh shit, we've got something that nobody else has done. And I was a huge fan of George T. Stagg at the time. I learned a hell of a lot from Elmer T. Lee and and Harlan Wheatley. So George T. Stagg was my favorite at the time. And I felt like we had something that could compete with Stagg. Nice. And, and we, were, we, were, we were only seven years old. So it was like, wow, let's do it. And we, we scampered around all over the country to find some bottles. We only needed 600 bottles. Um, <laughs> we were looking for a 335 milliliter bottle. And we finally found them some, through some glass packaging company. And we hand labeled every single one, literally putting the glue on the label and doing it with our thumbs down the side of the bottle uh, to, to make the bourbon. And once it hit the market, it went nuts. And, and it, the reviews were coming in from all over the place. And um, the Cowboy Bourbon kind of set us up on this, this plateau that we, we'd always aspired to. So it, it was a real honor to do that. And, and to think that we could come up with something that good at such a young age compared to these distillers from Kentucky that have been around for, for decades and centuries. Um, it, it gave us all a, a sense of um, purpose and we got yeah. busy and uh, we, we doubled down on the distillery over and over again. We bought two new 500 gallon uh, pot stills. We, 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 we went out for an investment round, which I had no idea what I was doing whatsoever. And, um, and we, but we pulled it off and we, so we struggled through the years and now we have something that we release annually, our Cowboy Bourbon. Uh, we have about six different brands in our portfolio and Donna's Todd, um, man, if I could reach out and kiss you, Donna's, I would right now. And I know you'd probably punch me in the face, but uh, <laughs> what you, what you, you've taken our, our Cowboy Bourbon to a whole new levels and, and God bless you for being my employee as well as my friend, my man. Salud. There you go. So, Donis, I mean, right away, as we look at, at, at this, I mean, the color is amazing on this thing. So tell us a little bit, of, before we even get to nosing and tasting and all that kind of stuff, talk to us a little bit about the color we're looking at. Yeah, sure will. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Steve, so extract is no problem here in Texas and uh, a perfect day for this example uh, you know I, I'm truly blessed and I don't think there could be a better job on planet earth I, I get up extremely early it's quiet it's peaceful I go to the distillery uh, there's the emails not dinging yet the text messages aren't donging yet it's just me and my barrels and there's over 20,000 of them so I can be pretty picky uh, we've made every drop of it. Uh, the distiller puts his initials on every barrel. So every barrel's telling me a story before I ever even taste it. And uh, it's just this peaceful moment 
about 5 a.m. Today it was 32 degrees uh, hmm. when I was there at 5 a.m. When I left at 3 p.m., it was 77 degrees. Nice. So Big think swings. about yeah. that's yeah. in that in that glass. I wish I could take the credit for it, but that's just Texas doing the work for me. Uh, that's all extraction, and I'm sure that uh, everyone's fully aware, uh, you know, of the heat and the expansion and the extraction that, you know, just imagine uh, we've had a, a lot of talk about music and I think there is a ton of connection between great distilled spirits and, and music. I, I believe in that. Uh, I'm tracking with those odd numbers and, you know, there's a lot of harmony there, but think of an accordion in and out, in and out. And uh, Texas is just ringing flavor out of those whiskey barrels. And uh, that's where all that beautiful flavor is coming from. I can't take that credit. But a little bit of the nuts and bolts, and please, uh, y'all, it's had a chance to breathe. I know y'all know how to properly nose a distilled spirit. You want to really take it in through the mouth more than the nose. Uh, <clears throat> make sure your palate's wet and moist and ready. A little sip goes a long way. And I promise you the finish on this bourbon is really going to make you question everything else you've ever enjoyed. <laughs> um, so, you know, Dan talked about those barrels, that what were we going to do with them? And uh, it's still the same story. It's just, I'm now looking for those. And uh, our, our workhorse is Garrison Brothers Small Batch Bourbon. Uh, we sell about 90,000 bottles of that a year. And uh, the way that I make that small batch is 35 to 45 barrels that I hand select every Monday and marry together. So when I'm tasting those barrels, I come across barrels that I call my piggy banks. Uh, Texas really puts these barrels through a ringer. They're all custom made, uh, but I don't care where you are. Every barrel leaks a little bit. Some leaks more than others. So I come across these barrels that you almost have to shake to see if there's any liquid left. Those are my piggy banks. And uh, I'll take them and put them in a hot box and uh, let them age a couple of more Texas summers. So these are all somewhere between five and seven years old. Okay. Should have had you know, somewhere between 15 and 30 gallons, but have one or two or three or five gallons. So, you know, I love to tell the story. Uh, you know, my mom made the best orange Kool-Aid on the block. I got to drink the whole gallon as soon as I got off the bus, but I had to do all my homework. That's how I got the gallon. About eight years older, uh, on the green Famica countertop, I saw the aluminum foil with the orange sparkles. I licked the Kool-Aid packet. It damn near ruined orange Kool-Aid for me. If anyone on this panel or anybody listening in has ever licked the orange Kool-Aid packet, they know what I mean. Damn near ruined it for me. My <laughs> cowboy barrels, my piggy banks, or my Kool-Aid packet. I can't taste them that day when I'm looking to support my small batch. I need to find 35 to 45 barrels to marry together to make that product taste the same within that whole year. And I'm doing that every Monday, you know, about 50, 55 Mondays a year. So, uh, I got to be real consistent there. I can't be licking a Kool-Aid packet. So I kick those piggy banks off to the side. We have a couple hundred of them. Um, I'll go back through them now that I kind of know where I want cowboy bourbon to be. I don't only just want it to be a hazmat bourbon. That, that's not the important characteristic. It's that long lingering finish. that just makes you want to put a cowboy hat on and come to Texas. So. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple. I saw cowboy hats have entered. So Evan and Todd and Paul. Looks like they've got one. And, and notes are coming in here. So cherry bourbon candy, the nose is interesting. Concord grape juice, pecans, cherry sours, uh, burnt caramel, chocolate, apple. All right. You know, Steve, something too, just so everyone knows, uh, we've had a bunch of uh, we've had a bunch of rise here on the on the panel. So this is a weeded bourbon. It's seventy four percent white, food grade number one corn. Uh, it is fifteen percent. Uh, Wheat, we grow most of it right here uh, on our ranch in high Texas. What we can't, we source from Texas. All of our grains are from Texas. 11% barley malt. So this is a weeder. It's the first weeded bourbon on the panel here tonight. So, uh, you know, weeders are a little sweeter on the front. Uh, the spice you're going to get, it's not ethanol, that spice. It's just uh, the extraction from the barrel. So there's a difference there in that spice. Okay. Steve, we've always prided ourselves on, on doing it from scratch. Um, the side of the bottle in Garrison Brothers says, uh, cooked, distilled, barreled, and bottled by Garrison Brothers Distillery in High Texas. We are very proud of the fact that we're grain to glass and always have been. And I know that's not always an option for folks. And 
I'm not smart enough to have figured that out back in the day. I had that option. Uh, a gentleman from a very big distillery offered me to sell some, so offered to sell me a hell of a lot of barrels, and I said that's just not who we are. We want to do it from scratch. So, uh, and and by the way, I don't. Everybody's business plan is different. Different. So this is not a criticism of anybody else's. Right. That's just how you guys do it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's give this one a taste and see. I'm I'm excited here. This is this is a. I haven't tried this one before. I have. Mm. Oh yeah, that is. That's uh, so pepper, leather, uh, dark fruit. Um, if we've done our job well. It should be just wave after wave after mm -hmm. wave of different flavors. Yeah, d definitely. I mean, you get some pancakes in there too. I mean, dark fruit. I like that. Damn. I'll tell you what, 133.9, <laughs> almost 134 proof. Um, that is amazing. It, do, it doesn't drink like a, that for sure. This is this is the, the one that you, you you sit around and you sip and you sip and enjoy. And uh, you do that till you fall off the chair, I think, one of those. <laughs> and if anybody's, that, drinking, you. Alone, if anybody's yeah. drinking alone tonight, just a little word of caution. In the proper dosage, this bourbon is an aphrodisiac, and I don't want anybody to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More coming in. Uh, graham cracker, brown sugar, dark cherries, very crispy. Nice. What else? Mr. Ed Escott, we haven't heard from him. He usually likes to chime in with some notes here. So should we change the name to the baby maker? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, there's every time you, you take a drink, it's it's different. I do get the graham crackers, um, barbecue sauce. There you go. One of uh, Texas' most famous barbecue sauce companies started buying barrels from us about four years ago. It's called the Salt Lake out of uh, Oh yeah, out of Dripping Springs, Texas, and uh, or Driftwood, Texas. And it was so funny because we were so excited about the project. We sold the barbecue sauce in our in our distillery gift shop, and it just sold out like that. Boom, forty dollars a bottle, and it just sold out instantly. And so we went back to the company the next year, and they said. Yeah, it sold out from our gift shop too. In fact, it sold out so quickly we decided to go talk to Maker's Mark about bigger barrels. <laughs> that pissed me off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fruit stripe bubblegum. Interesting. Fruit stripe from yeah. Justine. Yeah. I like fruit stripe. Yeah. Steve, I saw in the chat some people just asking where, where we are. So high Texas is uh, what we call the Texas Hill Country. It's conveniently located uh, between San Antonio and Austin, Texas. So we're about an hour from each airport. So, okay. Uh, I've seen that in the chat. So. Okay. Another and, question I saw in the chat is uh, where, what are the barrels made from? They're white American oak barrels. We use a whole range of different sizes from 15s all the way up to 53s for our bourbons. And we buy from multiple cooperages all over the country because some cooperages harvest from one area of the country, some cooperages harvest from another area of the country, and the chemistry, chemical composition of those barrels from different parts of America dramatically affect the, the flavor and the tasting notes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, well, great stuff. Uh, yeah, really, uh, really appreciate this one. I, I like your, uh, saying it's you know kind of akin to uh george t stag that's that's spot on so yeah and i always say stag's the king of bird anybody who listens to our shows and all that knows i'm a big stag fan and this is this is up there with that so it's cool very good great compliment all right well what i'd like to do thank you guys for coming on and and doing that i'd like to open it up to our audience if you guys have any questions about anything that we've tasted tonight about their companies about uh, what they're doing uh, you can even open up your mic if you'd like to ask a question, or you can, of course, put it through chat as well, and I'll ask on your behalf, whatever you prefer. Well, I'd like to say something uh, to Dan, what he was talking about. Um, 
thing, and he was blessed. He's he's enjoying, you know, sipping bourbon with his friends and all these other things like that. Um, I, I think that's really important. I, I think the idea of engaging in conversation, you know, where where vodka and gin, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you're gonna, you know, jump it on tables, drink it to much that's not with to me what bourbon is about bourbon is about sipping and engaging conversation and enjoying family friends everybody and and, and take a moment in your life to take a breath and enjoy what what's happening around you rather than trying to race drinking as much as you can so you can get as smashed as you can take your time have conversation so dan i appreciate you saying that because i think that's very important as you can see everybody that sips and talks it's all about conversation and there's room for all you know spirits there's a spirit company there's room for everybody it's like music if you hear a great song on a rec on the radio well not radio if you hear it on well spotify or series or whatever you hear a great you know you can like other people's records and music, you know? Same thing. Enjoy, relax, have conversation. I thought that was great. Absolutely. Two years ago, we started a 501c3, 501c3 non-profit public charity, and it's called Good Bourbon for a Good Cause. And the philosophy behind that is that good bourbon can change the world. Good bourbon brings people together, <laughs> uh, creates lifetime lasting, enduring friendships. Good bourbon creates legendary stories. And yep. that's what we want to do is tell those stories. I love that. That's yeah. a great message. I think you all, I think everybody here on this chat experiences the same thing and, and, and agrees to, with that. I've got a question for Donis. Donis, one of your products that I saw coming out was the, the Honeydew. Tell me a little bit about that one. Uh, I, I, I saw it online and it looks like a lot of people like that one. So what's the deal with that whiskey? Yeah, so our Honeydew... Uh, Dan's better half, uh, Nancy, always uh, wanted a honey-infused bourbon and uh, from the get-go. And we just kind of needed to build out a decade or so of, of just good bourbon uh, before we entered the arena of infusing good bourbon. In a way, uh, I just kept tinkering with uh, how to make uh, an infused bourbon that wasn't this syrupy, uh, liqueur style that uh unfortunately the bourbon industry uh yeah. is accustomed to so uh you know that's not a product you want out uh in year one or two when you're doing branding and talking about quality and things like that so we just waited but we didn't wait on on honing in the skill set and the craft and uh to make a long story short uh nancy wanted a a, a bourbon that was infused with honey and uh, it took me about a decade or so to get it just just right. And, and I think that we did that. And um, I started uh, finding barrels in the inventory on my palate that had this Burleson's Texas wildflower honey is a common honey here in Texas. Uh, and, it, and it has a very distinct flavor profile, especially for me on the front of my palate. And I started finding some 24 gallon Black Swan Cooperage barrels that were uh, from Barrel Barn Trace and Dose right in the middle of the barns between five, five and a half that had these honey notes. And uh, we dumped that bourbon, chopped the, the, the staves uh, up into little tiny cubes. Uh, Matt up in Maine owns a cooperage uh, that uh, Dan and I met through uh, the, just the industry, different conferences we had been to over the years. Uh, he developed a technology called FIT, F-I-T. So we took some of that cast strength uh, bourbon that I thought had honey notes. We took a 55 gallon drum of Texas, Texas Burleson wildflower honey, uh, about five gallons of that cast strength bourbon liquefied that 55 gallon drum. Uh, Matthew uh, took the little wooden cubes that we had produced from the barrels the bourbon had aged in and uh, infused that concoction into those little cubes. And they're about the size of a sugar cube. Uh, we made a big old tea bag, put it down in the tank for seven months. I checked it, which means I tasted it. And at seven months, I thought that I had a bourbon that had been infused with honey, not honey infused with bourbon. Uh, hmm. for, for my palate, there's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, we use packaging. I'll be the first to admit that. We dipped it in yellow. There's little bees on there. Um, I, I, we, we use some packaging to help get some palates there. I'll be honest with that, 
but even blind in a, in, in a black cup uh, and no clue uh, what was in it. Um, the folks that I've tasted on it, uh, you know, the 70, 75 percentile of pallets pick up, say honey. So, and that's what I wanted. And uh, it's an 80 proofer. It's just a great sipper. Uh, it gets hot here in Texas. It stays hot. You know, this, uh, this and a, a, a 44 ounce Sonic cup full of Sonic ice is something special in August. <laughs> nice. What other questions does anybody have for anyone on our, our on our panel? I have a question for Chris. Okay. That I'm pretty sure everybody else on here who has barrel proof cherry is, is going to ask. Uh, is it going to be an annual thing and are you going to produce more bottles? Yes. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, we, so we came out with the barrel proof cherry this year to celebrate the end of cherry harvest <clears throat> in a time when, uh, for any of you that know Traverse City, um, the National Cherry Festival is a very common event to be uh, familiar with. This year we didn't have a cherry festival, so we celebrated, we celebrated the cherry harvest and um, we took about 300 man hours to produce a one hour virtual segment to showcase how we make our cherry whiskey. Um, and the plan between now and eternity is every year at the end of cherry harvest uh, to release another version of the barrel proof cherry and, uh, and kind of walk and talk through how it's made and what makes that expression what it is. And uh, there are still some bottles available at our tasting rooms. Uh, we have a tasting room in Traverse City and one in Detroit. Gosh, Justine's going to be getting emails. Justine, can you make a run for me? All these uh, folks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jen, exactly. Brenner's, uh, Jen Brenner's is shaking her head. I know her dad's been after one of these bottles too. Uh, don't answer, don't check your emails tomorrow, Justine. Yeah, um, my phone will be going off. Shortly, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. She's not a mule, everybody. She's not a mule. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, the uh, Kentucky artisan wants to trade some for some Billy Goat. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, Tim's got a question here. It's the old uh, uh, wants to ask everybody something that you wouldn't do again. So, any anything that stands out that uh, you've done that's been a mistake that uh, that you've learned from. Neil and Ari, we'll start with you guys. What, any, anything stand out in your mind? A mistake that I've learned learned from? In, in this business specifically, yeah. Oh, business. I was going to say, I made a mistake once and I drank champagne in Guinness. <laughs> and it turned me into a person I don't ever want to be. <laughs> so, let's just, I, Guinness is kind of on its own is okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't mix it with champagne, okay? No, never mix with champagne. It, it changes your molecular brain to some other place that you don't ever want to come back to. So. <laughs> But I learned is that I continue to learn. I mean, it, this is this is fun for me because Ari has taught me so much, and and we t speak so much about the synergy between music and and spirits and blending and distilling and everything. And there's there's such a common uh, ground to so many things. You know, if you look for it, it's all out there. You just got to keep your conduit open and kind of look for it. And there's just, there's a lot of things in life that are great, and bourbon's one of them. Yeah. Quick question. Yep. Uh, so uh, I had a discussion. I have a show on Monday where we had a whole 30 minute discussion about uh, uh, odd numbers versus even numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this happened because of your drummer, the, the 15, the 15 year, the low drummer. Whiskey. So drummer. What, yeah. yeah. What is, I want to hear it straight from you. Okay. What is, why did I spend two hours looking for batch two just to find out that there's never been a batch two? It was just batch one and then batch three. Right, because batch three is actually batch two. Correct. Right. So, yeah, I know it's kind of confusing, and it's not meant to be trickery or anything like that. Is In music, um, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief because I don't want to get into this thing. But in music, when a note falls on a, on a beat, it's right in the center. And you can either go to the left or to the right. You go to the left, it's a blue note. You go to the right, it gets on a sharp side, right? So here's your beat. So in music, when 
I'm writing, recording, producing, if it's an even number, say 160 beats per minute, I will lower it to 159.50 or 100, and, you know, I just kind of mess with them because I, the even numbers just mess me up. Now, when we started having discussion about the batches, I asked Ari, I says, is this okay? Are we allowed to do this? Because I, I just, I don't know, something just bothers me about even numbers. That's just a weirdness that I have. I, I don't know. I wish I could give you a better explanation for it. But <laughs> batch three is batch two. Okay. That's <laughs> That's the best I can do for you. It never it, it, was it ever on the table. It's going to be thirteen bar reserve, not twelve bar. No, I know twelve bar. I had to stick with that because okay, that's, that's a like, thing. That's a, that's I, a I thing. Right. That that's integrity. You okay. know, twelve bars is not like a thirteen bar thing. You know, so <laughs> I'm just. But I can sure. change. I can change the tempo. I can do that. So <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. What else do you guys want to know? Our Kentucky artisan team. Any anything you guys can weigh in on? Something that mistakes you've made that uh, wow, you would be something you you've learned from. Yeah, don't put Tabasco sauce into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we yeah. we partnered with the Tabasco brand. Had uh, Jack Daniels barrels that went down there, aged tobacco sauce for seven years, then came back here for a Jer Jefferson's bourbon uh, rebarreling, and we barrel aged, finished some in there. For another two years and uh when we took the barrel i was working uh, my first year here as a distiller and i was standing on top of the tank we had it upside down and pulled the bung out and uh it pulled a vacuum and was pepper spray for the entire distiller oh, oh wow so we weren't doing tours like we were now at that time but there was a handful of us that had to run to the shower stations and everywhere else so if you're thinking about that pepper finish you might want to <laughs> stay away from that okay yeah. I, I burned up a $5,000 pump in the first week. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's not not easy to recover from. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Steve, um, since a lot of these folks yeah. who are on the call are, uh, are, are younger in this industry than I am, um, it's a business response to Tim's earlier question, things not to do. Um, don't expand too fast. Please, I beg you, don't expand too fast. We, we, we went to, in 2015, we went to 24 states across America. And then all of a sudden we got hot and we couldn't satisfy purchase orders in any of the states we were in. So take it easy, take it slow would be my recommendation to the other distillers that are here. Take it easy, take it slow, stick to your geography. Dan, I got a quick question for you. Tell me about the the dynamic of working with your brother because it, it, he's a funny guy, and uh, I've seen them both do a presentation at Total Wine here, and then we, we had him on the Bourbon Show, and I, I talked to him, and he always he never he always has to mention he's the better looking brother, and, uh, and and he likes to give you a hard time. Is is it like that nonstop with you guys when you guys are working together? This kind of back and forth. His material is shit, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at me now, does he look like the better looking brother? Uh, no, Charlie joined the business in 2013. I, uh, it took me a very long time to convince him to sell his restaurant. He had a very successful restaurant in Scottsdale, uh -huh. Arizona. And I said, I said, I need you, I need you, I need you. Please come help join the business. And he's like, okay, well, tell me about healthcare. I said, you won't have any. Tell me about dental. <laughs> you won't have any. Tell me about vision. You won't have any. Uh, how much can I, are you going to pay me? You're not going to get paid. And um, I eventually convinced him to come join the business. And then I spent the next five years correcting the wrongs that Charles created in the marketplace because he's so full of shit, he has no idea what he's talking about. He tells a great story. And that's what this business is really ultimately like. Am I wrong, Thomas? No, it, it, you're 100% you're accurate on, on Charlie w without a doubt. And uh, I'll... I'll Steve, I'll field the question about, you know, hey, what's that thing you've done that you're not going to do again? We're definitely not going to talk about all the equipment I've tore up because my boss is on the line. So, right. uh, <laughs> you know, this we're not going to we're not going to go there. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing for me, this December is going to be 13 years that I've uh, that I've had an opportunity to make bourbon whiskey for Dan and Charlie Garrison. And as I said earlier, I'm truly blessed. But so, uh, uh, something I learned years ago was I quit worrying about the tasting notes, and I focused on the people. The people that I get to make the bourbon with, the people I buy the grain from, 
the people that I buy the barrels from, the people who come and help us bottle our bourbon. I started focusing on people and I quit worrying about the tasting notes, the, oh, the hen of cherry on the north side of Japan. I got past those people and I put people first and I have truly been blessed since that day. So, you know, that's the thing I learned is let's not get so focused on trying to tell everybody what to taste and let's just hang out with people and taste it. So yeah. that's the biggest, that's my biggest lesson. Yeah. yeah. This is reflective of that. You know, bourbon brings people together. We've got people from of all course. across the United States on this uh, event and uh, you know, we do them every other month. We the next uh, time we'll get together will be January 4th. And uh, that, that event looks like it's going to be sold out. We've got uh, like five tickets left. So, and then we'll be back in March after that. And yeah, this, it's one of the most exciting things about bourbon that gets people from every cross section of life and brings them together. And it's, it's a cool thing. So a lot of fun tonight. I like to be incredibly respectful of our individuals. So I want to thank them for coming on. Uh, we enjoyed some great whiskey. So thank you from the team from Kentucky Artisan, uh, Three Chord, Traverse City and Garrison Brothers. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being on this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop the recorder and uh, our guests, you are free to stick with. We like to, uh, we have a group we usually stick around and talk a little bit, but uh, we always like to end this right at 90 minutes and uh, that's what we're gonna do. So I'll turn that off. And again, thank you for being on and appreciate it and have a good night, everybody. Great night. Thanks, Steve. Thanks everybody. Absolutely. I gotta cook dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see y'all later. Sounds good. <laughs>